Welcome to another edition of Inside the War Room. Ryan Ray here as always. And today I have on a guest who I've been excited to bring on. I will link to this in the show notes, but I have both of his uh, two volume copies of his China history. Uh, and I'm talking about Dr. Harold Tanner from the University of North Texas, who is a professor of Chinese studies there. He's got a PhD from Columbia, uh, a master's from Columbia. And he's, uh, you've got degrees, you've got more degrees than I can probably list. You've got five here, I think. <laughs> you have been well studied in Chinese history. You also have um, a, a, a degree in, um, let's see here, the intersectionality, I believe it, yeah, from Oriental and African Studies and Master's of Arts and that. Uh, Dr. Tanner, it's an honor to, to have you on to speak with someone who is well studied on these topics as you. Thank you for your time today. How are you doing, sir? Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So let, let me just ask real quick. Um, obviously, you have, and I will will list all the books at the end and put it in the email for people to see. I think you've got five books um, on Chinese history, military history, general history. What's the fascination from your standpoint as a historian with China? What got you interested in this topic? I think uh, what got me interested in the topic was uh, growing up in New Jersey and wanting to get away. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was always interested in, in stuff that, you know, in, in, in opening my mind, different perspectives, going different places, travel and so on. And uh, China just, you know, I kind of stumbled into China. Um, I took a course in Chinese history when I was in high school and that really fascinated me. And, you know, that, that was the year of Mao Zedong was still alive at that point. Oh, wow. um, and uh, when I got a chance to travel to China in 1984, um, that's what I did. And, and uh, then I, I had to be I had to make a career out of something. You know, I was 20 some years old, so I became an academic by default. OK, so you, you mentioned going to China in 1984 for perspective. I was born in 85 uh, and I've went to China in 2019. So China has changed a lot from 84 to 2020, especially uh, just, just really quick. What have you observed maybe personally uh, some of the changes? Cause when you go to China, they talk about, you know, they'll show you pictures of this used to be rice farms or this used to be empty field. Uh, and now it's you know, concrete and steel and buildings. I'm, I'm just curious as someone who's been there on the ground, what are some of the things that, that have maybe stood out to you as the mm -hmm. biggest changes uh, in China over those last 36 years? Okay, well, I mean, one of the, I mean, okay, there's the very obvious change of massive economic growth and therefore massive building and construction and cities where rice fields used to be and all that kind of modern, you know, state-of-the-art subway systems and fast trains and all the rest of it, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's that. That's, that's the obvious thing, right? That's just right there on the surface and you can see it immediately. Um, right. I think what is underneath that is also really significant. Um, there's changes in the, in the lifestyles and the attitudes of people, uh, both, and, and there's good and bad. And, and uh, they're, 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 the standard of living has increased tremendously for everybody. It's increased more for rich people than it has for ordinary people. But that's probably par for the course in any, any, any society, right? Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, it's not as... The place is not as, as straightforward as it used to be. Um, when I was there in 1984, nobody would cheat you. It was a really honest, it was, it was overwhelmingly honest. You know, there, there was very little crime. I mean, there, clearly there was crime, including the sort of crime that I took part in, like uh, changing money illegally on the black market. Um, <laughs> but the guys, who did the, the guys who did the money changing would never rip you off. They were always very honest money changers when they were changing. Basically, there were two types of currency. And, and you could right. uh, you, could, you could leverage your, your your dollars from one Chinese currency to the second Chinese currency and, and make a, a good 10, 12 percent profit on it. So that kind of extended your travel funds. Um, so there's also kind of a, a an increase in confidence in the Chinese people as a whole. And some of that is good. I mean, and some of that is some of that comes across as 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 arrogance and and anger and 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 resentment. And some of it comes across as as, as very healthy, more greater degree of national self confidence. So, and it depends okay. on, of course, who you're talking to and what their status is. But there's certainly the the, the change, change in attitudes. China's a more complicated place now. There's more crime. Um, 
but there's more more good things to it. So, so those, I think those changes in, in culture is, is, is an important kind of undercurrent. One of the things I appreciate about talking to people who have you know been on the ground and, and kind of realize that is that there, there's there's different perspectives, right? You have maybe the the academic perspective, and then you have the average citizen perspective and the business person's perspective. Everyone comes at it with a, a unique perspective, so it's always good to hear uh, not just what you can read in the textbook, but but what people have actually seen on the ground and, and how it feels, uh, because that that that's a unique experience that's kind of hard to capture, it seems, and so. Um, uh, how, just real quick, and I, I want to get the books. How often do you go to China, or, or have you been to China? How many times have you been to China, maybe? Um, I'm not sure how many times. I haven't been. I, last time I was in China, mainland China, was 2014. And I was in, um, I uh, went to Taiwan in, uh, gosh, I guess 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the yeah, summer 2016. Uh, and Korea, what, in 2018 or what is it? Or something. So, so, um, China, China, I've been, I went a lot back in the 1980s and 90s, and then again in the um, first part of the 2000s. Okay, so let's talk about the makeup of modern day China. I think I was telling you offline, um, you know, but first I went to South Africa. Uh, you know, I got off the plane, and you realize quite pretty quickly that South Africa is made up of a bunch of different people groups from a bunch of different histories. Um, and it shouldn't surprise you, but as Americans, you kind of understand all that. You don't really think about the different makeups of countries and stuff. And so when you go to China or Africa or uh, South Africa or wherever, all these countries have a lot of things that make them up. So at a high level, obviously there's, you've got books on this stuff that you could talk about for hours, but maybe break down for our listeners. What is the modern makeup of what we call, you know, China today um, is from, a, from ethical, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, from the standpoint of your religion, philosophy, uh, people groups, and stuff like that. All right. Well, the People's Republic of China is the successor regime of the Qing dynasty, okay? The Qing Empire. And that's important because China is basically an empire. Just if you, if you think about, about Russia, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Russia was, the, the Soviet Union was the successor state of the Russian Empire, and modern Russia is the successor state of the Soviet Union. So, it's a place that was built through military power. Uh, it was built by conquering places. And, and the Qing Empire was no different. And that, so what, what you have in China is you've got a China, sort of the, the China where the people we think of as Chinese live, right? Mm. The, and then, then you've got all these the places on the periphery where there are other, other ethnic groups are, are uh, more, more the identity. Um, China has, uh, 50 some reckon the formally rec I think it's 56 formally recognized ethnic groups of which the Han Chinese the people we think of as Chinese when we think Chinese language Chinese food Chinese literature or whatever H-A-N Han people mm -hmm. okay and they make up like 90 some percent of the population right and so all of the other ethnic groups put together are the other eight eight percent or so right uh, so that that ethnic that ethnic dimension to it is very important because that that's why you have issues like Mongolians protesting about changes in in, in language instruction in the in the schools and 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 Uyghur people in Xinjiang, these Turkic people in Xinjiang protesting and 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 uh, being reeducated or whatever in Xinjiang and and Tibet and so on and so forth. Um, so you've got that, that ethnic component of that, that ethnic structure of modern China is extremely important to understand. Um, so uh, in terms of religion, um, you've got a whole variety of things. Uh, a lot of people, especially a lot of urban people are really not, don't have a particular religion because China has been under the rule of the Chinese Communist Party since 1949. And the Chinese Communist Party is not particularly strong on religion. Um, so a lot of people, especially urban educated people are fairly non-religious, although maybe they, maybe they might have some sort of general, I mean, you'd have to ask them, right? <laughs> I ask an expert, ask, 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 ask a Chinese person, what are your religious beliefs? But and then you can look at polling and say, okay, but you know, who, how many people believe in Buddhism, such and such. But uh, you know, some people have some generalized religious beliefs and, and there are a certain, there's a, a fairly large, although small percentage, but large in numbers Christian population. Uh, there, are, there are Muslims, um, um, people who practice Taoism and so on. One thing about Chinese, about religion in the Chinese sense, aside from people who are Muslims, for example, is that traditionally Chinese religion was not 
it didn't, it didn't demand that you would believe in just one religion. As a Chinese person, you could go to a Buddhist temple when you wanted to ask a Buddhist deity for something. You go to a Taoist temple or a, or a popular religion temple of any, any other kind if you wanted to ask those deities or something. You, you, you didn't have to like make a choice and a commitment to I'm Buddhist, I'm Taoist, I'm Confucian or whatever. You could be all of those things. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the the hard thing to understand uh, or, or to think about from the Western perspective, because in the Western perspective, especially in the U.S., you know, people will argue, you know, the U.S. is founded upon um, Judeo-Christian principles, or, or you know, or you know, today we'll argue over, you know, things, and we'll bring it a religious aspect or a non-religious aspect over there. Uh, and then when you think about China, at least, um, you know, I think a lot of Americans would think that the Chinese um, are, you know. Um, religious in the sense of that you that you kind of laid out that they either have some kind of kind of buddhist tie or um tie to confucianism and, and so it's maybe kind of hard to understand how that shapes the modern thinking of china because as you mentioned they are under the, the chinese communist party and so how you know when we look at what impacts their their current thought is it seems like you're saying that it, there's not really that much of a religious background it's more of you know communism or marxism or, or socialism it's a cultural background, background okay and because even even if you, okay even in the United States if you are not religious you may not believe you you may not be a believer in Christianity or Judaism, but you still have that culture right right okay with the, what you know the what informs the way you talk you're, you're drawing on that on that culture which includes those religions like it or not whether you believe in literally believe in the existence of those of those deities or not mm. and the same thing in China right people may not believe literally in in Buddhist deities. And they may not believe that Confucius was the greatest sage in the world, but they're using that language anyway. And so the culture is a continuous thing. A culture is what people draw on. Um, and it's just that uh, it's not necessarily a, a, a religion. Some people have religious beliefs, some, some don't, but they're all drawing on the same cultural background and they're same using the, 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 the concepts and the imagery and the vocabulary and the metaphors uh, that come with that culture, just the way we do. I mean, we, we were, we constantly using words and metaphors and crap from ancient Greece, even though we may not even know that we're doing it. You know, we may not even know what ancient Greece was, um, but there it is, right? And so with Chinese too, I mean, they've got this incredibly long past with a lot of written history, mm -hmm. a lot of continuity in terms of, of those cultures and language. And all your past always gets recycled through through you, right? And in, in the present, the past is recycled in the present. You You use the past in the present to express yourself and to to formulate your ideas and so the Chinese do that just like anybody else just they're doing it with Chinese culture in the Chinese past yeah so let's go back uh, talking about the books here China a history volume one and volume two um you know if you if you look at kind of anybody that I've looked at it, that studies Chinese history like you do a historian they always kind of start back at this this dynasty and, and there's kind of a debate over whether or not and I, uh, I believe it's Xi Dynasty is how you say it. You could correct me if you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If um, it, it whether it exists or not, you talk about that in the book some. And so that part of the the question I have is is twofold. You talked about the current being shaped by the past. Um, and, and through your book, there's there's a there's, there's a tendency it seems like um, where these rulers that have come up through China, um, they all are tied to agriculture and to the ground and to the common person. And on some level, that's because they had kind of an agrarian culture, but it seemed to also be that their roots are kind of like, that's the kind of leader that, that um, at least in periods of Chinese history that they wanted is that goes back. Does that go back to maybe the beginning of kind of how the Chinese culture is believed to be formulated or am I just reading into something that's not there? Well, I mean, like, like any culture, they, they start off as it's, 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 you know, you, I mean, you go back far enough, it's going to be hunting and gathering, right? And right. then agriculture starts. And but these, these agriculture made, agriculture is what the product, the productivity of agriculture is what makes these states possible because you, you can, you're settled, you produce a lot, you have, you have surplus product, and that surplus product can be accumulated and used to support armies and buildings and, and, and wars and, and culture and all those other things, right? And so agriculture is, is really fundamental. So any ruler had to be uh, cognizant of agriculture and, and the, the art of governance uh, to provide good governance included very, very much management of agriculture and, and management of agricultural product and, and uh, setting of the calendar so that uh, everybody's, you know, 
he keeps track of the, of the, of the time of the year and when, when to plant, when to harvest and that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, any, any ruler, any, any ruler, any, any, any official at any level had to be cognizant in, of agriculture and understand it uh, at least to some degree and, and manage an agricultural society an agricultural economy because that's the economy that was supporting the entire structure. And so if you go back, um, you, I think the, the, the date or what, 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 BC is kind of when these, the origins of Chinese history, mm -hmm. at least documented starts. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, 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 and you know, for, <laughs> for the West, obviously, <laughs> we don't, we're not going back that far. And you, you mentioned a minute ago, we have, they have this kind of continual um, history. And one of the things that, that I've, I'm kind of with, like to hear your thoughts on is if you read like you know confucius and some of the stuff some of the history it's there but it's, it's hard to tell if this is first-hand accounts or second-hand accounts i'm just curious as you've gone through you study chinese history uh there is a lot there but how do you go through determining you know what do you believe is accurate or what is you know uh the, the highest degree of probability of, of being true versus what is more apocryphal because it seems like they're just like with any any culture the further mm -hmm. you go back the harder it is to kind of validate some of these claims oh of course uh, and those really ancient texts, okay, the texts of the of the of the of the the Zhou Dynasty, the 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 the, the, the uh, texts of the Zhou of the Zhou of the, of the Qin Dynasty and the Zhou Dynasty, and even the Han, even the early Han Dynasty. I mean, those texts, especially those classics like Confucius, Mencius, uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War, um, all, all the rest of the texts of that era of the the Zhou Dynasty era. Um, all of those were put together afterwards. And there's, it's, it's a really specialized, uh, it's, a, it's a specialization in itself of analyzing those texts and, and, discover, and figuring out what parts of those texts are genuine, what parts of them are forgeries that are written later. Uh, any one of those texts really, it has to be understood as the product, not of a single, not of a single author, but the product of a group of people. Right. Sometimes, sometimes more than one generation of people. And, and so you, you know, you analyze those texts as best you can, and again, that's not that's not something that I personally do. Um, sure. We all have our areas of specialization within Chinese history, as you can imagine, and I'm not a specialist in in Zhou Dynasty texts. But uh, those texts are can be analyzed, and what what scholars do is come up with their best analysis of what is reliable and what is uh, and what is forgery and when the forgery was done and and why and what significance the forgery has uh, because the forgery is still a genuine forgery from the <laughs> from, from the Han <laughs> dynasty or whatever it was right it's, it's got its significance too um, and then then you you do your best with the sources you have and these where you put together the, the, the story and if if 20 years from now somebody comes up with a better interpretation or discovers a new source in a you know unearthed in a tomb somewhere then we change right Right. So one of the things in the book you do is let me just say for the listeners, this book is um, I don't know if it's meant to be considered a textbook or not, but it's, it reads very easy. And not only is it an easy read, it, it links you at the end to all of the or I say all, most of the sources or whatever it is that you're quoting to. So you yeah. can do further study. So I, I really appreciate the, the way in which it's written, makes it accessible to mm -hmm. even the simple men, simpleton like myself. Um, so uh, I appreciate that. But you go through and you talk about the, the changing of the map and, you know, the expansion of these cultures and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, kind of where I was starting with is we kind of think of China as China. And, you know, we, we know about the Mongols and we know about there's a great wall and, you know, there's right. a Ming dynasty and Mao. And but when you kind of dig into this, this has been this is not necessarily like the United States where we settled the East Coast and move westward. It's kind of this expansion and contraction of these different uh, nations, I don't know, nation states is the right term, but uh, well, uh, go, go ahead. Different Mark. states, different, different, different states is a, good, is a good term, okay? Yeah, yeah different states, right. So maybe may, may kind of unpack that some, just again, at a high level, I know there's a lot here that you've got two volumes, but just some of the things that, 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 that when you were studying Chinese history that, that surprised you, because um, it's not only, as you mentioned, you have 90% now that makes up this modern population, but the, the, these regions have, have changed and grown, and uh, China's a big place. And so the weather's not the same, which causes mm -hmm. different problems with as far as, you know, where you're going to grow your crops and where you're going to live. So maybe uh, talk about the map, how it shifted, and, and some of the significant changes that you observe when you're studying Chinese history. Okay. So um, one of the things to start out with is, like you say, uh, 
every single dynastic regime has a different footprint on that map. Some of them are smaller, some of them are larger. Uh, so a lot of historians actually will say, uh, they don't even like to use the word China to relate to anything. They wanna say, okay, what are we talking about? Are we talking about the Han Dynasty? We're we talking right. about the Ming Dynasty? What, which one are we talking about? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that, but, you know, getting that, that, that said, one of the stories is, is of, of a migration mm -hmm. because the, the Chinese people that we think of, their, their origins were in what's the now, what's the Central Plains. It's, it's the, 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 like the, the Yellow River Valley area, okay? And, and part of the story is, is those people migrating, the Han people migrating to the South over centuries. It's waves of migration generated by, by wars, uh, partly, largely, uh, and and uh, and by uh, people wanting to, you know, moving to get more land because uh, they they needed they need to, to to find you know of, of, of population pressures on land and needing to migrate to places where there was more land, and so the process of populating and and changing the the geography of the of the Yangtze River Valley and the and the 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 the, the, the areas south of the Yangtze River, changing those into into settled agriculture and 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 you know places that are populated by by farmers living in villages paying taxes rather than small independent villages of different ethnic 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 identities so that that sort of process of migration goes on all the way from from the, like the the uh, era of the Han dynasty was uh, uh, Back, you know, both a few hundred years before and after uh, BC and 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 uh, CE, and and also uh, all all the way into the 20th century. Really, those migrations are going on, pushing farther and farther to the south and the southwest. Uh, even in the uh, in the 18th, 19th uh, centuries, you have uh, you have clashes between Han people and and uh, local people in in the southwestern provinces like Guizhou and Guangxi and and Yunnan province. Uh, as as Han migrants come in and clash with with uh, with the other ethnic groups over over control of resources. So one of the questions I have is when you look at the map today, um, and you kind of talk about the, the different dynasties and, and how they um, you know they, they they changed and expanded. Um, why is it that the modern map is uh, what we call modern day China is, is so large, and other um, states like uh, you know Japan, the Koreas. Um, why, why is it that they don't have as much prominence in the in the uh, in that area as the modern day Han people do? Because the Han people or the Qing Dynasty, which was Manchu Manchu rulers and Han Han subjects, uh, and and let's it had a fantastically productive agricultural base, which provided the wherewithal to to build those empires. And of course, if you look at Japan, it's too hard to get anywhere, any place else. In Japan, you know, the Hideyoshi tried to conquer China and he only got as far as Korea and got squished, okay? <laughs> because it's just projecting power from Japan uh, under, under pre-modern conditions was extremely, extremely difficult and, and not very realistic. But uh, in China, you've got this vast land area. So, uh, and even then projecting power out to Mongolia to, to what is now Xinjiang to Tibet that could really only be done effectively in the uh, 18th century. So it's, it's a matter of, of, uh, of resources and the, 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 Han, the Han Chinese or that, that resource, that agricultural product is what made those, that empire building possible. So when you say Chinese history, and I don't remember if I read these exact stories in, in your books or if I saw them somewhere else, but there's a story of... Um, <clears throat> of an African nation sitting over a giraffe to, to China, and I think they end up sitting yeah, yeah. back. Uh, and then you have the story of the Empress of China, which set sail for China from the U.S. in what, 1777, 78, something like that. Um, contact with China in, in, in the West, or at least you know Africa in the West, has been around for quite some time. What are some of the, the, the barriers that's kept maybe um, China from westernizing uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, just, but why hasn't it happened? Because the contact, if you go back historically speaking, goes back further than you might would think because, again, we, we, we sent a ship over what, a year or two after or within a decade at least of the, of the Revolutionary War, and it never really materialized in anything. Uh-huh. Um, well, China, China, think about this. China has, China's culture uh, grew up there and it, with 
the, the closer you are to people, the more interaction you will have with them. Right. So Chinese culture is a product of, of interaction between Han Chinese, various um, um, nomadic people to the north, the, the, you know, from the Xiongnu to the, to the Mongols, to the Manchus, um, uh, also a product of, of uh, interaction with, with Korea, with Japan, to, to a lesser degree, with Southeast Asia, to a lesser degree. But, so China, it's not that China has, and, and also India, I mean, there's, there's, there's significance of elements of Chinese culture that, that are the product of interaction between China and India. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese medicine has been, been, been uh, influenced by interaction with India. Chinese art has been influenced by interaction with India. Chinese music is unthinkable without interaction with inner Asia. A lot of the, what we would think of as traditional Chinese musical instruments come from Central Asia. So it's not that China has, has been this, 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 this people who are like sitting there behind their great wall, not interacting with anybody and this, this, right. this, this, their culture uh, developing totally independently. Um, and, and, and likewise, I don't think the English had an awful lot of influence from Japan um, uh, or from China for that matter. But uh, okay, when you get into the, the era of say the Ming dynasty, when you were talking about the giraffes and so on, um, <laughs> In the Ming Dynasty, the, 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 the Chinese Chinese seafarers and traded with 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 uh, with with the with the Indian world with the with the, with the Muslim world. Muslim mm -hmm. Muslim traders came to China. A lot of a lot of the interaction was that the Chinese economy uh, during the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s into the 1700s, the Chinese economy was so massive that people came to China. They brought stuff to China to trade. Mm -hmm. um, after the after the discovery of the New World, if you had a boatload of silver, which the Europeans got lots of boatloads of silver, right, from 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 uh, Mexico and Peru, if you had a boatload of silver, what can you do with silver? I mean, you can't eat it. <laughs> you, you can't dress in it. You can't. You got to change it into. It has to be transformed into something else. You want to make a profit off of it. Mm -hmm. China had the biggest economy around the hat, and China, China's economy was based on silver. So the medium of exchange was silver ingots. And so you could, you could make more money with your boat of silver by taking it to, 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 to China, trading it for Chinese goods, then trading them for something else, and then retiring, okay? So, so uh, people came to China uh, to, to trade, and Chinese didn't really need to go very far otherwise. I mean, there are lots of Chinese traders in Southeast Asia, big, big trading community all, 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 all throughout Southeast Asia. But farther than that, Chinese, Chinese merchants didn't need to go because they, and they wouldn't have made any profit on it. Um, as a merchant, you go where you will make profit. And, and, and for a Chinese, there's nothing they, no, there's no reason for them to try to take boatloads of stuff to England or to, to, to Italy or, the, or Spain because it costs a lot. And those people are coming to China to get that stuff, right? They're, yeah, they're yeah. The, the, yeah, the no, 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 I just cut you off. But now, now, as you say, as you say that, that actually makes a, a lot of sense because if you read the story of the Empress of China, the the U.S. wanted to send a ship over to get the tea from China. They were mad at the Brits, obviously, and they wanted to get mm -hmm. some porcelain and all this stuff. And the, as, as you you tell the story, it makes sense because from the U.S. perspective, China had what it needed, but China wasn't like I think they end up sending the ship back over. Uh, Mm -hmm. Some Chinese on maybe a year or two later. You made the story. You probably know the story, but anyways. But but now that you tell the story, it's like yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That they have what we need, so the influence was more being exported out, whereas they didn't need to import much other than you know silver stuff like that. So as you frame it that way, that's, that's quite helpful to to kind of think about what was going on back then because uh, you're right that 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 they had what the world needed, not the other way around. And 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 and, and the world had the silver that right. they needed, and so right. I mean the, the silver was a major part of of their culture. It's just that silver is not is not paintings and <laughs> right 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 no no, no. That, that's, a, that's a good way that's a helpful way to as a helpful way to uh to frame that because it's it's been something i've i've, I've wondered why it didn't because obviously the tea would be something that's impacted our culture obviously we you know today we think of that more as a as a british thing you know but it really it's yeah. it's not it, it comes from further east than the brits are and so um you know they've influenced our culture in ways that we probably don't even realize and so um it's yeah. uh, and i mean the the uh the 
Chinese design stuff in the in the 18th century was very popular in Europe. There was a whole sort of craze of what they call chinoiserie, mm. you know, Chinese style gardens and Chinese style architecture and, and Chinese style interior design and stuff. It was it was it was thought to be it was thought to be very cool. Um, and porcelain trade. I mean, they they would take they would take their designs to to China and say, okay, and and and, and contract with Chinese porcelain makers and say, you know, we want a whole set of dinner. Uh, we want a whole dinner set. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he, this this number this number of plates and this number of this and that and here's 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 the here's the here's the crest of the of the great Moncrief family or whatever it is and we want this on the we want this crest on all of the on, on all of the porcelain the Chinese art, art, artisans would say okay yeah we can do that and they did but uh, but they didn't look at that and say gee we want we want that kind of design in our own homes they're, they're like no we're just doing this for export <laughs> so. Help us understand, we have kind of this time period we're talking about, which is, you know, at least the, the story I was telling you would be, you know, 1777 or whatever it was, 1780, uh, mm -hmm. Ming Dynasty. So that's a, that's a portion for Americans less familiar with, but, you know, you talk about Mao, that's something that's going to be a little bit more familiar, um, but still, you know, probably not a lot of Mao historians that are listening. Um, but how do you get to a spot to where you have this culture who is exporting things that the world needs, people are coming, knocking down the doors to getting silver to mass starvations under the rule of Mao. What, what, what changed that, that, that opened the door for Mao to come in and to kind of rule the way that he did from your perspective? Um, hmm. Uh, let, let me go back to the 18th century. Right. Yeah, yeah, please do. Please, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, yeah, I'm asking the, the simpleton question. Please give me the, the, me back the, the correct way to think about it. Um, really, if you ask the question, when did China fall behind? Okay, when, when does China right. yep. start to be poor and backward? Uh, it's the early 19th century. That's when the, 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 the balance of power shifts, the economic balance of power, the technological balance of power, the military balance of power. Um, obviously, things don't happen overnight, just like you wake up one morning and, and Europe is ahead and China's behind. Uh, it's, a, it's a process, but the tipping point is somewhere around 1800 or so, uh, because the, the Western countries have uh, experienced the Industrial Revolution, which is a whole big story by itself and sort of arguments about why does the West have an industrial revolution, but let's just, let's just let the West have an industrial revolution, okay? <laughs> they got an industrial revolution and that means that they can produce a lot more stuff a lot faster and a lot cheaper and that they can create a lot more lethal weapons and that they can project that military power and that economic power abroad with, with better ships, including steamships. Uh, and at the same time also, because the European economy was changing, the whole global economy was changing, silver became more valuable in Europe than it did in China. So the Europeans no longer wanted to bring the boatloads of silver to China because, because it was not profitable anymore. They wanted to bring something else instead, which turned out to be, opi to be opium, which is a great product, um, has, a, has a great demand potential. Um, a lot of repeat customers. A lot of repeat customers. So, uh, and, and in the meantime, also China, China, China was experiencing um, eco ecological stress. Uh, the, the soil was depleted. Uh, agricultural productivity was, was low. Uh, population ratio, population to land ratio was terrible. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on the land and because of the population, because you have more population and, and less arable land, you've got migrations into, into, into less productive areas. You've got uh, people who are, Stripping out, you know, cutting down more forests and then causing more floods because of the of, of a loss of forest cover, etc. So all of these kind of went into it. There's, there's an ecological crisis. There's a population crisis. There's a a change in the global economy. There's uh, the Europeans jumping ahead with the industrial revolution, and that just changes the entire the entire power equation uh, on a global scale. And uh, China gets uh, left left behind and weak, and and therefore subject to the power of of, uh, of imperialism and and uh, that lays the the uh, that that lays the the, uh, the the road for the Chinese Communist Party to take power, which again is a long story. But um, you want me to stop and pause there and let you ask another question? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a quick question there because what's what's striking about the Industrial Revolution thing is is that if you go back, um, you know, it, China's technology. Um, in the ancient world was far advanced over the Europeans is my understanding. And so 
to kind of get left behind, how much without, I don't know, you don't want to get deep into the industrial revolution stuff. How much do you think it is because of what you said a minute ago, which is they were mainly importing silver and didn't have to deal with the rest of the world. And so there wasn't really a need for them to keep up with the times. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a structural issue. Okay. As to the, the, the structure of the economy. Um, there's uh, one, one argument about uh, with this regard is that uh, the Chinese economy was running very well. It did not, people, people invest in what they need, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese had uh, the ability to, to, to make a, a really good uh, a pump out of copper, uh, but there was no particular need for it. So that technology never got really developed. Um, in, Euro in Europe, they had different, different needs and, and, the, and the different resources. Europe, Europe also had the resources of the new world to tap. And that, that, that enabled Europe to kind of jump out of the, the trap of, 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 of depleted soil and, and lack, of, lack of fuel. Um, and of course, the discovery of coal in Europe contributed to, to fueling the Industrial Revolution, literally, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the, the Chinese, China simply, uh, it, the structure of its economy uh, got to the point where it's so involuted and, and, and uh, so sort of self-sufficient. Again, for instance, if you have a lot of labor, then you don't invest in machinery because right. labor is cheap. Right. So you, you, I'm but, really simplifying things there. And no, there's, yes, there's right, very yes. complicated arguments about about uh, about sort of the the economic and uh, and sort of supply and demand reasons why uh, why China does not have an industrial revolution. Uh, so I'm simplifying them, but I want to get across is the idea that you look for more of these structural issues, these structural reasons. Um, Rather than rather than a uh, rather than a cultural re rather than a cultural reason. Okay, so with the major caveat that we were trying to hit the high points here, uh, mm -hmm. agreed. <clears throat> um, you, you said okay, so this is the time period that they kind of fall behind. The industrial revolution happens, um, and then you you look up one day, and the, and the Japanese are over there, you know, slaughtering Chinese at will. Uh, mm -hmm. World War II is going on. And then you have Mao in charge, and you know their their ties with Russia. Um, it, it's it's just a stunning turn of events. Obviously, history has a lot of stunning turn of events. It's just a stunning turn if you once you, you know, if you're not steeped in maybe Chinese history, um, maybe and maybe for you wasn't a surprise if you just studied it historically. But when you, the more you study the history of China, it's like wow, it's just surprising that that it went this way. Um, but I still kind of torn on the question of um, a people with such a long and rich history that they weren't able to right the ship. So once these structural things are showing up and the industrial mm -hmm. revolutions happened, what were some of the things that prevented China from being able to um, modernize um, you know, and, keep, and catch up with the West? Weak government and poverty. Weak underfunded government. Now the Qing, the Qing, the Qing government was weak, very, 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 it was very, it was stretched very, very thinly over a very large, country, uh, the Qing government didn't, was not very efficient at collecting taxes. And so when, when the Qing government in the, in the 19th century, when they're faced with problems and challenges and they want to modernize, particularly, you know, if you're, changed, if you're faced with a challenge from uh, another military power, you need to modernize your military. Uh, well, if you don't have money, you can't do it. <laughs> okay. And, and to be really crass about it, yes, the Qing, the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, especially the latter, the last half of the 19th century, a lot of people understood what the problem was, and there were steps taken to modernize China's military, and there were successes, but they weren't enough, and they weren't thorough enough, and, and the fundamental reason was lack of resources and lack of strong leadership. And so we get into this spot where you have the the Great Leap Forward and and, and all of these 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 things that are that are horrific um, mm -hmm. lights on, on Chinese history. Um, just we don't talk about that. Maybe some of the listeners are more familiar with it. I, I'm curious from the historian's standpoint um, when you're studying these type of topics. You know, we talked earlier about studying the ancient documents, but studying these type time periods that are you know more recent. Did you find that that it was easy to study those, or are there a lot of conflicting reports? Because you know, if you get on Wikipedia or if you go to a book or whatever, and say, "Well, Mao killed this many people," I've always wondered how easy was it to really collect this data, and how confident are we in what we think happened during these time periods of more modern Chinese history? Um, more confident than the past, I guess, but uh, in the, at the same time, less confident because. Um, 
you do have conflicting interpretations. Uh, um, the Great Leap Forward and, and uh, other, you know, the Cultural Revolution events like that, uh, yeah, there's huge amounts of resources, of sources available to, to, to look at these things. Uh, but there is a lot of debate about, about, uh, about what happened and, 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 and why it happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, you just take your, your, the sources and, and uh, get as, met, as many sources as you, as you can so that you can cross check as much as possible. And then, then come up with what seems to be, based on those sources, the best possible uh, story to tell, the best uh, analysis that you can put forth, and and then have at it. Let it, you know, put it out there, and and see if somebody else comes up with something better. Okay. Well, we're up against getting up a clock here. Got about eight minutes left. So, ask you a couple of easy questions now. Sure. What is your favorite period of Chinese history? to study, to look at, to read about, to discuss. If, you, if you're sitting down having a cigar on a Sunday afternoon and someone says, I want to talk China, what, what do you enjoy the most about Chinese history? Hmm. I think I enjoy uh, the Chinese Civil War uh, period the most because I'm, 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 I know more about it, so I can talk about it better. <laughs> uh, if, I were, if I were an ordinary person reading Chinese history, I think the Tang Dynasty is fascinating. And when was that for the for perspective? Tang Dynasty is the 600s, 700s, uh, 800s. I mean, uh, uh, I, I'd have to. Uh, gee, I'm I'm not great on on dates. That's kind of a historian, isn't it? I don't remember dates like like that. Well, the Tang Dynasty is 618 to 907. So I was right. 600s, 700s, 800s. Right. That was just a fantastic, a, fa a fascinating period of time because it was so multicultural and 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 it was powerful and great great literature, great poetry great parties <laughs> it was like our roaring 20s i guess Just absolutely <laughs> okay um so that's kind of you, you said the chinese civil wars you're maybe you're, you're, the, you're what you know about the most um what brought you what, what fascinated you the most about that was it just there was a uh, an open spot in the academic market where chinese civil war history hadn't been studied or did you get attached to some of the characters and the story and the flow what what, what, what sucked you into that portion of the history well fundamentally i think it was it was the question of, uh, because there's a lot of history, well, a lot of stuff had been written about why did Chiang Kai-shek lose that war? Mm. And not so much had been written about why did the Chinese Communist Party win the war? Mm. Which is, of course, a different question. What, was, what were they doing right? Mm. What were they, what were, why were they successful? I, I, I wanted to answer that question. I wanted to look at that question because it was different. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, the, some, of the, some of the characters involved from Mao Zedong to from Mao Zedong to, uh, to Lin Biao to Chiang Kai-shek, they're fascinating characters, right? There's a lot of good stories there. Okay, and we, we have here, i um, got your Amazon pulled up, we'll link to this again. You've got the two-volume series that I have in my hands right here, China History. You've got uh, one China History, I guess that's a volume maybe of the, of the first one or a Yeah, that's the combined, there's, there's a combined, okay. there's a combined version and there's, two, and there's splits, two volumes. Okay, and then you've got a couple of... Um, <clears throat> Uh, military history books. Why don't you kind of go through those briefly here, and then you've got one on anti-crime campaigns and Chinese criminal justice. So why don't you go through those three books, maybe tease out what's in those a little bit. I think you did just a second ago um, some, yeah. but tease those out a little bit more for our listeners. And uh, uh, let's strike, go hard, strike hard on anti-crime campaigns. That's a really, that's a really very, very, very scholarly kind of thing about, about Chinese, Chinese Communist Party's uh, 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 criminal justice system in the, in the early 1980s. And it's not, that, that I wouldn't recommend for the average reader. Um, the book on uh, the two books on the Civil War, the Battle for Manchuria and the Fate of China, um, that that looks at the uh, at a particular battle, it centers on a battle which took place in 1946 and sort of before and after, and deals with the question of of what influence uh, George Marshall's uh, Marshall mission, his his negotiations with uh, Chiang Kai Shek and the Communist Party, what influence did they have on the way on the outcome of the, of the Civil War on the on the ground? So there's a kind of combination in that book of of diplomatic history and military history, uh, looking at how how negotiations and combat interact with each other, um, and then what the Chinese Communist strategy was. The second book uh, that goes along with that, the uh, uh, Where Chiang Kai-shek Lost China, the Liaoshan Campaign, um, that focuses on the Liaoshan Campaign, which was a huge, huge uh, military campaign, which took place in uh, the fall of 1948. But I go back to beginning in the summer of 1946 and looking at how did, the, how did the Chinese communist forces get so powerful that they wiped out Chiang Kai-shek's armies in Manchuria and therefore 
set you know set themselves on the path of of, of victory. Okay, and final question for you: um, Give us maybe one author who writes about China who you find uh, unique or creative or has insights that you don't necessarily have to agree with, but you you like to uh, you, uh, read their perspective on China or Chinese history. Oh, hmm. Let me see. Um, let me tell you about. Uh, I'd say we'll go back to the Tong Tong Dynasty. Edward Schaefer. Edward, Edward Schaefer, S C H A F E R, author of The Golden Peaches of Samarkand, a, a study of Tang exotics. It's a fascinating book. Uh, and there's a second one called The Vermilion Bird Tang Images of the South. And they're about Tang culture. Uh, and they're a really, really interesting window into the, into the culture of that time foods and and plants and arts and and birds and 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 drugs <laughs> <laughs> okay. maybe alcohol too uh, but but that, that those are fascinating books Schaefer is just uh, you know this is fascinating stuff okay well it was um thank you for the books obviously um it's, it's a pleasure to and not, not to choose them to me but thank you for writing them it was a joy to read them to go through them again okay. they're written it. for uh, even the simpleton like myself. So anyone can pick them up and read them. They're two volumes. You can get them on Amazon. We'll link to all of that. And um, also, you know, it's it's always nice to have someone nearby to do these interviews with. Of course, we're doing this via Zoom, but you're up in uh, University of North Texas. I'm down here in Granbury. So just on the opposite sides cool. of Metroplex. Mm -hmm. So um, right. Dr. Nair, thank you again for your time and look forward to following your work in the future. Any any new books you're working on? Um. Not, none that I want to uh, reveal at this point. I'm <laughs> okay. A couple of things, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I, I don't want to jinx them. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, we'll be on the watch for stuff as it comes out. Thank you again for your time today. And to the listeners, we'll be back next week.